just uh, go ahead and start the workshop until when these two fellows sit down, please. <laughs> okay. So, uh, welcome to testing 0 to 100. My mission here today is to teach you guys all about testing, from unit testing to API testing to uh, uh, for your back end and testing your front end with component testing, which will be covered by one of our guests, and uh, as well as uh, UI testing, end to end testing, and visual regression testing with another guest as well. So, uh, we're going to get you guys from uh, testing zero to testing hero. Yep. So, quick introduction about uh, who I am. Uh, I, my name is Shiling. And uh, I am a co-founder of UIlicious. We provide uh, tools for you to automate UI testing. But before I used to uh, be, uh, uh, before I founded this company, I used to be a full stack developer at another startup. I was doing back end, front end, uh, everything from analytics to just everything. Uh. So um, and like my history is that I used to I used to really suck at coding. I was a junior developer once before, and I wrote zero tests until I burned my hand too many times, and I decided uh, that I should start writing tests from now on. So um, the reason why I'm giving this workshop is because I came to learn that um, uh, that it wasn't just me who didn't have the habit of writing tests. Uh, in fact, the company that I joined in, uh, back then, there was, it, it was a six-year-old company, a uh, startup actually, and uh, there were uh, quite a number of senior developers, but testing wasn't in the blood, so I joined projects and none of the projects had uh, tests at all. So I had the fortune or misfortune of joining this particular project that was written in J, uh, jQuery, and Angular at the same time. So some parts of the pages are just jQuery and some parts of the pages are Angular uh, spa applications. So it was like mixed. And not only that, it was also jQuery UI plus Bootstrap 2 plus Bootstrap 3. So you can imagine if I want to add one new feature, uh, it, I would take a very long time. So of course I refactor it, right? I need, I need the code to be clean for me to be able to work on it. But of course if you refactor, I don't know why, I change one component and a totally unrelated component breaks. So, so of course I'm very scared like, because I released so many bugs to production. Uh, I got scolded a lot of times. I got scolded not just by managers, I also got scolded by customers. Like, hey, why are you like that? Okay, so, so can I, I, learned, I learned my lesson and started writing tests and, and on, on my own. So, um, I, I usually disapprove of uh, any gatekeeping behavior, but if there's one thing that I'm very gatekeepy about is that you're not a real software engineer if you don't write your test. Okay, so writing tests is super important and um, I learned to write tests also because I wanted to go on vacation with peace. Okay, so I, I, I broke tests while I was on vacation. I gonna work when I came back. So it's, you don't want that uh, in your life. Like you just want to go, you don't want to sleep uh, in your hotel room and be thinking, oh shit, I don't know whether the, the team is okay or not. Should I check my email or not? Okay. Yeah, so you don't want that. You just want to sleep in peace. So today the talk, uh, talk is about covering tests from your front end to your back end, cover all ends. Okay. So uh, can I just get a show of hands of any who here is uh, write tests? At least uh, unit tests. Ah, okay, not bad. Okay, we have like fifty percent, so it's pretty good. Uh, so today, um, this is what we are going to cover. So I have already mentioned it. We're going to cover uh, unit testing with Mocha and Chai. All, all of it is JavaScript because it's JSConf. So I won't be covering uh, uh, JUnit in Java, but uh, unit testing with Mocha and Chai. We'll do uh, API testing with H Chai HTTP, and this also includes. Uh, setting up your server and tearing it down, uh, setting up and tearing down your server and your databases so that you get um, clean environments to run your test reliably. And um, we're also going to cover end-to-end -end testing with WebDriver.io and also with using uh, UIlicious. And uh, uh, bonus materials because we have a few uh, interesting guests at um, JSCom, so we'll grab them and also ask them to do uh, some uh, demonstration of testing with Apply Tools as well as JS. So, um, I think to start off, um, how do we get to 100% testing? It's sort of like this mythical end of the rainbow that you will never reach, but we're going to try. And 100% um, uh, testing is not enough uh, for you to just do um, unit testing. It's not enough. So the reason why it's not enough is because you could 
you, you, you can't just uh, test things in isolation. You need to test things when they work together. So this is uh, very silly. <laughs> you don't want to stand in front of the sink and then start washing your hands. Like, oops. Yeah, it looks. So this obviously uh, integration testing was not done here. So um, there is uh, three layers of testing. Um, we have the, oh, I can't, I can't just press next. OK. So we have uh, three layers of testing. That is uh, unit test at your bottom. And we have integration test and acceptance test. So this is in a pyramid structure because what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to write more of the unit test and uh, less of the acceptance test and the um, uh, integration test. So uh, the reason is because the tests at the top of the pyramid, they cover more of your code. But because they cover more of your code and they also require more setup, they take longer to run. So if you want to be very efficient uh, about uh, running your tests, uh, write more of your unit tests. And for uh, whatever that is not able to be covered by your unit tests, you, you write some of the uh, integration tests and some of the uh, UI tests. So that you, if you write all everything in UI tests, your test is just going to be uh, slow. Your entire test suite is just going to be quite slow. So that's how you balance out all of these things. And I think this is one of the things that uh, people get confused by. When I work with teams that have zero tests, like my old company, uh, even the senior engineers back then, uh, we were thinking, yeah, yeah, we should write tests. And, but every, like, there, there was two factions. So we actually had a faction that say, we should start from unit tests. And another faction say, no, 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 we should start from integration tests. Because at the end of the day, it is uh, how everything works together that's more important. And then for me, it's like, I don't care. You start unit tests or uh, API, API tests or uh, integration tests or UI tests. As long as there is tests, there is starting somewhere is better. Like 1% test coverage is better than 0% test coverage. So, and uh, one good guideline, if you want to uh, take away from learning all of these tests and you're still confused, like, okay, where, uh, what part is the best uh, place to start with testing because it's so overwhelming that um, then I think it's always good to start with the scariest piece of code that you are too afraid to refactor. You write the test for that first. So for me, uh, when I worked on that project, uh, I actually didn't write the test for the UI test first. I actually wrote the test for the payments module because we had a very complex um, calculations for how we should build the customers. And the business team had new ideas every uh, month. So they want to change the formula for how they want to build a customer. So in order for me to safely make sure that the logic is still correct, I write my test so that I can change the, uh, then, then I would change the logic according to the requirements from the business team. So, so that was like the piece of code that was scariest for me because if the building module fails and uh, we end up not charging the customer, the, cus the, the company will lose money and I'll gonna even worse, okay? So that was like, that's a guideline. Just start with the scariest piece of code if you cannot figure out where is a good place to start. Okay, so let's uh, move on to some of the labs. So today's lab is called Testing Zero to Hero because we're going to catch bugs, Pokemon bugs actually. So at the end of the day, you're going to be a hero. You've got to catch them all. Okay, so we're going to start with the uh, workshop. So I need you to head over to this GitHub repo and uh, fork it, clone it, and uh, run npm install. And if you uh, have any issues doing the NPM installation, you can call me uh, and my TA, which is uh, Eugene over here, and also uh, Aaron also over there, uh, who will go around to help you guys if you're stuck with NPM installation. So uh, we'll just give you guys about 10 minutes to do the installation, and uh, yeah, just call us if you need any help.
You guys want some water? Water? Mm-hmm. Water? Thanks. Mm-hmm. One water? Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. One water? It's okay. I'm fine. Thanks. You want some water? Okay. Do you want some water? No, thank you. Okay. Water? Okay. Do you want water? Okay. You want? Uh, Sorry? Your mocha is global. Uh, mocha is local though. Yeah. It's not inside your install definition. Uh, it will be installed later. It's a uh, later steps. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like it's, uh, they will install it as the. The DB is not populated yet, right? Yeah, the DB is not populated. They will populate it in exercise 3. Okay. Do you want to pass out the water? I'll pass it out. Yeah. Water? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. You. you need help? Uh, no, I need the water. Oh, you need water. Oh, it's over here. Oh no, uh, it's not cloned properly, so I'm just going to redo the clone, but okay. the chrome is not working. The chrome is not working? No, chrome. Chrome is not working. <laughs> so it's a different problem altogether. Oh, okay. Just, I guess we just close the real phone again. Ah, okay. Okay. Writing is very small. Ah, this board is also not that big. Ah. Cause 
because I, I think it does actually do a trick for the dip. It just, it just died down there. So, um, but we just use opening. Oh. So ask them for someone. Do we need green? No, no, this one is out of green. Oh, okay. Okay, um, we're just gonna move ahead first. Uh, and if you need any help, if you're lagging behind, you could ask the TAs to help you. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, explain the structure of the project first. And we're going to start with uh, testing with Mocha. So let me open up the project. So over here in our project, uh, we have uh, the, the, what we want to do is to test the uh, Pokemon class itself. So the Pokemon class is just very, very simple. It just sets the attributes of our Pokemon. So it's, uh, our Pokemon class is inside uh, models Pokemon.js. If you open it up, you can see that the Pokemon has a number of attributes. It has an ID, it has name, it has types. You can set, set it as a bug type, a grass type, electric type. Uh, it has some uh, other attributes that says how strong this uh, Pokemon is, how fast this Pokemon is, does it use any special uh, uh, attacks, and whether or not it's a legendary Pokemon. Yeah. So um, what you want to do is to make sure that uh, we we'll do a few simple tests, like uh, testing whether if we set the name of the Pokemon. Yes? Oh, zoom in. Is this big enough for the folks at the back? Ken? Okay. So um, we're going to test the set name uh, uh, method of Pokemon. And um, when you set a name, you should obviously check when you get the name, it's the same name. So uh, what we want to do first is to make sure that uh, we we're going to use Mocha to run uh, to set our test. And Mocha is uh, a testing framework. What it does for you is to manage the setup, the execution, the teardown, and reporting your test. So you can actually plug in uh, different assertion libraries to Mocha, and Mocha can still uh, will just run using those libraries. All it, all it does is to catch whether the assertion library throws and a type of error called the assertion error, and then it throws the assertion error, it would mark the suit as a failure. So besides that, you also do the teardown and the reporting. So the reporting, you can actually plug in any kind of uh, reporter. So the reporter that we're going to use is just called the spec reporter, but you can actually change it to a, a HTML uh, reporter if you just want to see your test printed out as a HTML document. So you just keep things simple. Uh, first thing first, let's uh, do npm install mocha uh, dash save dash. And um, this, you should already have uh, the script, uh, test script set up, so you don't need to do this step anymore. And uh, the first step is what we're going to do, first exercise is we're going to test uh, Hello Pikachu. So once we, uh, let's create a test after you have done your npm install uh, mocha. Okay, let me uh, just delete this. So first thing first, just do npm install mocha save dev if you haven't ready and what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up our test in the test folder so some of the test has already been created for you so let's uh, write our test in uh, unit test one dot pokemon and uh, how mocha works is uh, the test suits uh, uh, to define a test suit you use the word describe so we can we are going to say describe uh, Pokemon. And within uh, describe Pokemon, we are going to create another test uh, suit itself to test uh, to group the the test for set name together. So we could test uh, every we could test uh, whether if we set name with an empty value. And, uh, whether it produces an error, or and we can test if we uh, provide a, a proper string, uh, whether it properly sets the the Pokemon name. So this these are two test cases, but we want to group it into one test suit together. So we're just going to create another <coughs> test suit. Say, describe uh, the set name function. 
Okay. So what we're gonna do next is uh, we're gonna import our Pokemon class. So cons uh, Pokemon require from the uh, go up one level, two level models and Pokemon. <coughs> so now, uh, if you wanna define the test script itself, we need to say um, it. Oh. So this is uh, the case itself, and what we should, what we wanna say, uh, what we wanna put in the first parameter is a description of the case itself. So what we wanna uh, for this case, we should just test uh, it should set uh, name when given non empty string. And then we proceed with the function and we'll write our test script over here. Close this. So we're gonna create our Pokemon, uh, var Pokemon equals to new Pokemon. So the Pokemon uh, constructor, we're just gonna leave it blank first and we're gonna test the setting of the name through the name function instead of through the constructor itself. So Pokemon.set name, uh, and we just go and call this one uh, Pikachu. And oh. what we have to do at the end, so every test has to test uh, one hypothesis and also have to have at least some assertion. So what we're gonna assert here is to say, um, expect that the the name of the Pikachu is uh, equals to, uh, the name of the Pokemon is equals to Pikachu. So add assertion here. So Mocha itself doesn't come with any assertion libraries built in, but Node.js has an assertion library. So we're gonna import the Node.js uh, assertion library cons um, require, um, assert actually. Assert equals to uh, require assert. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the uh, Node.js assertion library. So this is the documentation for the assertion library in uh, Node 12. And what you can see is, I think the, the one that, the, the assertion that we want is this assertion. So we just wanna say assert the value is equals to, and what it does is uh, it wants the input to be evaluated into a true, uh, true value. So if it's not true, it will print out the error message. So what we're gonna do here is uh, assert uh, Pokemon dot name equals to Pikachu, and uh, if it's not Pikachu, we just print out Pokemon name should be Pikachu. We can actually, I believe, the message is optional, so we can actually take this out, and um, they would generate a default uh, session message for us. Okay, and to run the test, uh, if you already have this, uh, you should already have this set up. So scripts dot uh, test. So we, I, I have already broken it up into different types of scripts for unit testing, for API testing, and end-to-end -end testing. But what we can just do is npm test to run our test over here. And over here, you can see my results after running the test. It says, yeah, it's correct. Uh, we are able to set the name to Pikachu uh, correctly. So let's say if, uh, let's just break this test on purpose and just say that, okay, uh, I think this is supposed to be Pikachu instead of Pikachu. And uh, we can just run this test to make sure that it fails. Oh, actually this is not correct. Huh. I'm not too sure why is this not, not validating. Hmm. Let's use the equal instead of uh, double equal. So we can also use the equal uh, method, which says uh, this is what you actually uh, get and what is the value you expect. So let's try this and maybe this is better. Okay, now this is failing. So, so the Node.js assertion library is a little bit weird sometimes. So to be honest, I don't like using the Node.js assertion library by itself, and I would rather use Chai. So, uh, 
Yeah, I'm failing this test in, on purpose. Yeah, so if I put it, uh, just to make sure that the assertion library works, sometimes you must make check if the, your test is valid. So it's always good to just fail your test on purpose, just to make sure that uh, your test is uh, working as you expect. Yes? Uh, another question. Uh, in Java, it's usually that you put in the expected value left and then the testing value on the right is in the opposite way around. Uh, it depends on the assertion libraries you import actually. So over here we are using the Node.js library. So the documentation, if you read the docs, it wants you to put the actual value and then the expected value. So we're going to use another library. We're actually going to use uh, the Chai library next. So uh, the Chai library lets you write tests in a BDD style. So a BDD style lets you describe your tests like uh, regular English language. So it's, uh, it, Chai supports two forms of uh, BDD uh, style uh, syntax. One is should and another one is expect. So that one would sound a lot more uh, easier for you to read as well. So we're going to try importing the Chai library next and to test our, to write the same test in the Chai style. Okay, so let's uh, get rid of this assertion library and we're going to import the chai library instead. So if you haven't already done so, just do npm install uh, chai and save dev as well. Oh. And while, you're, while it's installing, we are going to import the should syntax. So cons uh, should equals to require chai and um, chai provides you a module called shoot um, but you can't just import uh, shoot on its own you actually need to call shoot so what shoot does is that it extends the object class and so this will extend the object class so that what you can do here instead of saying assert equals uh, the actual versus expected you can say uh, Pokemon dot name should uh, okay should be equal Pikachu. So we're gonna go ahead and run this. Ah. And uh, this is uh, passing with the should syntax as well. So we can take a look at the chai library itself to see more of the different kind of uh, syntax that should provides us. So you look in the API and you can click on the should uh, and expect syntax. You'll see that uh, it's very English-like and what you, uh, it provides you a language change. So you can pre pretty much change your, your test uh, as if it's English. So, so some examples is, uh, let me see if we can find some shoot. Yes? Okay. Uh, one more. So for those, especially those with uh, <coughs> installation errors, if you are lost at any point in time once you catch up, er, uh, if it's not obvious everything that was being scrolled through on the GitHub readme is in that same repo. Yeah. So you can follow the steps in there. Also, I think a few of you flagged out that we have a typo in there regarding the module parting, the dot dot slash needing to be dot dot slash dot dot slash so just take Yeah, the uh, I might have nested the, the, the test in one more level when I was uh, finalizing the workshop so it might a little bit, uh, be a little bit different uh, in the actual documentation here. So anyway, uh, the shoot syntax, I'm having a little bit trouble finding the examples for shoot in the child assertion library but you can see expect is expect, uh, if you want to check equals I think, let's find equal. So uh, equal is very similar to should. Equal is just uh, expect the actual, uh, the value itself to be equals the actual uh, value you expect it to be. So, and you can do a lot of kind of, sort of assertions for should. So we can do should uh, expect the Pokemon name to uh, be a string. So maybe you could pass in a number and maybe expect it to be coerced into a string. You can also expect, uh, you can also pass in uh, the Pokemon types. Like if you pass in two types, like the bug type and the grass type, and then we can say, okay, go grab the type and make sure that the types are exactly length of two. So we make sure that we didn't just add 
uh, two, um, two types and we get one out. So that is, uh, you can do a lot of kind of assertions. So let's try doing your, um, um, the test in, with the expect syntax instead. So to import your expect uh, class, uh, the expect assertion, we will uh, do something similar as well. We can require, we need to require the module, require chai, and uh, we require the module inside chai that is called expect. And we can say uh, expect pokey more name to be equal Pikachu. Let's run this again and make sure that it still works. So it still works. So this syntax, uh, so, so it's, uh, it depends on what, what you are comfortable with. You, want, you can choose uh, the shoot syntax, you can choose the expect syntax, or if you just want to uh, use uh, assertion as well, uh, we can do that. So, well, it's always good to test a uh, happy scenario. Uh, users will make mistakes. So it's always important to test whether your application throws a proper error message. So let's try testing if we, what happens if we set uh, the name to be an empty value. So if you try to set an empty value on uh, Pikachu or uh, on the Pokemon, it will, should throw you an error that says the name is required. So you create a new test case and it says it should um, throw error if name is missing. So we're gonna create our Pokemon again. <coughs> and we'll set it to empty. So uh, what we're gonna do is we are gonna be using the Chai's assertion library instead of the Node.js assertion library to check for errors. So the reason for that is uh, Node.js assertion library uh, seems to not work in the way that I expect it to. So uh, Chai's the way Chai checks for error is a little makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, okay, let me find trolls. So you can test um, two scenarios. You can actually test trolls and test does not troll, but we're gonna test trolls instead. So trolls accept function as the first uh, parameter. So the function is the the uh, the code they expect to troll the error. So we're gonna actually import the chai assertion library first. So, so we are replacing this uh, native assertion library with the chai assertion library. So let's go ahead and require chai first, chai dot assert. And what we're gonna do here is we are gonna do assert dot trolls function. And we're gonna put this piece of code over here um, that should throw an error into the first the function. So this when if you set name with empty value, this should throw an error. And I believe the error name is called um, name cannot be empty. So there's uh, other types of assertion going on. So like name cannot be string. You can test that if you want to as well, but we're gonna, gonna test um, name is empty. So the second parameter that the um, that, that uh, assert a a expects is the name of the er error message itself. So it shouldn't throw a generic error. It shouldn't throw like a, a type error. It should throw the proper error that says name is empty. So that is actually helpful to whoever's uh, using this library, uh, whoever's using the set name method itself. So we're gonna go ahead and run the, the test. So now we have two tests. So we should see uh, two, two tests being ran. Our first test, which is set name when given a non-empty string, and it's also issue throw error. So let's say if we uh, correct this. Uh, it will, uh, so if we actually set the name and it didn't throw any error, the assert.throws will will throw an error, uh, will fail the test and say, well, we're expecting an error to be thrown over here, but that didn't happen. So this is uh, how you should test your negative scenarios as well. Okay, so it's very simple to write tests for uh, 
uh, synchronous functions. But then uh, if you want to test callbacks and promises, Mocha can handle that as well. But the way you write your um, test for callbacks and promises is a little bit different depending whether you're testing a promise or you're testing a callback. So how Chai expects you to write your um, test for callbacks, for example, it gives you a done function so that when you're finished uh, call, doing your callback, you can call the and, and you should do your assertion, and then after that you call the done function to tell uh, Mocha that you're done uh, with this test itself. So for example, if you are testing a function called chef dot make sandwich. And uh, we can uh, pass, uh, and we expect the chef to make sandwich to either give us an error or a sandwich. Like error could be like there's no sandwich, and, uh, and or to give us the sandwich back. We could say like okay, if error, then uh, call the done function with an error. Otherwise, uh, oh, we get, we we don't have an error, but we expect the second parameter sandwich to exist. And then we once we are done with our assertion, we call the done function. So if you're doing a promise instead, uh, we should, uh, it's similar, but uh, Mocha is able to handle promises on its own. So all you need to do is to return the promise. So let's say chef.make sandwich is a promise instead of a callback. You just say chef.make sandwich, then if the sandwich, we, we got the sandwich, then expect the sandwich to exist. Uh, otherwise, we will catch the error and then throw it back up and uh, Mocha will just handle uh, the, the, the error. Okay, so we're going to try this with the uh, Pokédex. So the Pokédex is, uh, is the database of your Pokémons itself. So we're going to create another test. Uh, we're going to start writing our asynchronous test in number two, uh, Pokédex.js. And um, I think let me check. Okay, so let's try writing a test for the save function of uh, Pokédex. So when you save a, po uh, a Pokémon to the database, and if the Pokémon doesn't exist, we should get the ID, uh, the ID for the Pokémon should be set. So we can set that up. Ah. So you create a suit called uh, Pokédex. Uh, okay, we can describe the save uh, function. And then our test is just uh, it should add Pokemon to Pokédex. So the Pokédex uh, is inside our DB folder itself. Uh, so if you uh, open it up, the entire Pokédex uh, is a it returns promises. So you can see that uh, we we need to connect to our Pokédex with a storage, and uh, we'll close it. Uh, there's also a save function to add the Pokémon to the Pokédex. Okay. So let's create our Pokédex. Let's also import our Pokédex first. And we need to connect our Pokédex to a storage uh, mechanism. So we're just gonna. So so we're gonna uh, because everything is uh, is a promise. Uh, it will actually be simpler and easier for us to read using the async await method. So I'm gonna add uh, async to the front of our function over here. So async. And then we are just gonna await for uh, our Pokédex to be connected to our storage await. And we're gonna uh, we're gonna save our our Pokédex uh, our uh, our connect our Pokédex to a storage file. There's our so we we are stor storing our data in a with MySQL Lite, so we'll it will actually just save it to a file. 
storage and uh, test the SQL like tree. Yeah, this should be fine. Okay, so um, so we're gonna create our Pokemon, but Pokemon again, new Pokemon, import the Pokemon class, models, Pokemon. And then uh, after we created a Pokemon, we're just going to say, okay, Pokedex, uh, save the Pokemon to the Pokedex. And we're just going to await this. And at the end of it, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to assert that the Pokemon ID exists. Pokemon.ID. Who we'll even say that, okay, the Pokemon ID uh, uh, should exist, I believe. And uh, Pokemon ID is uh, a string, maybe? I, I believe it's a string. Oh, I think it's a number, actually. Yeah. Should. Oh, uh, to be. Okay, I think it should be a string. Should be a string. Yeah, the ID. Yeah, so we're gonna save the Pokemon to the Pokedex. And the Pokedex behavior is that if the Pokemon never existed ever, uh, we are gonna uh, set an ID for the Pokemon. Oh, uh, okay, cannot. Let me check if it's a. Uh, oops. I think uh, we need to initialize our... Yeah, we need to create a DB first. Uh, sorry about that. Let me check our instructions for creating the DB. Huh. So then, uh, hey, let me check if you... Uh, if you guys get lost, there is a test.solutions folder, which I'm going to cheat with and actually grab our db uh, setup function which i think is not here either uh, it's the next one. yeah yeah So give me a bit of time to test if this works. Okay. Hmm. Oh, actually the, the failure is because the Pokemon name is not the same. I think I ran, ran this test before. Yeah, you need to run next migrate. Let me just tra check this out first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what you need to do first is uh, um, let's skip ahead to this segment here. Uh, I need you to install next and to set up the database. So the instructions here is uh, npm install next dash g, and then run uh, next uh, migrate up with the but change the environment to test itself. So npm uh, install next. G. So after you install that, you're just going to run the migration function, which is uh, next migrate up, but change uh, the environment from development to test. Okay, why isn't it able to? Uh, uh, 
Okay, if you, you get, get this command that says you cannot open the database file, that means you need to create your storage folder. Oh, why is it still not able to? Yep. So what this does is uh, it's going to run the migration uh, steps and it's going to become relevant later. So uh, in these examples, we are just going to run the test first beforehand. But later on in data examples, we are just going to get the test to always roll back the, the database and to migrate it up and then to seed your database. So, so first, we are just going to do the migration by hand first. And then now let's run the test again, IBM test. Yeah, so this test is now passing because uh, we finally set up a database and uh, we are the, it's running a test to say that, okay, uh, it should add the Pokemon to the database and the Pokemon ID should exist and the ID should be a number. So is, uh, is anyone stuck so far with the, okay, so we're just going to give you guys a bit more time to uh, get this set up because next can be a bit tricky. So, so I'm going to repeat the instructions again uh, to, to set up your database. Uh, after you install Nex, uh, on globally, you, uh, we are going to run the migrate up. And what migrate up actually does is it's going to run all the migrations within this folder over here. So if you look at the migrations folder, uh, you'll see that there is two uh, functions over here. One is up, one is down. Up actually does the setup for you. And uh, what it uh, over here is going to create the Pokemon's table with the uh, incremental ID and the name, and then it expects the name to be unique as, as well. And uh, uh, you will create a JSON uh, table, uh, JSON column, and uh, all the attributes and timestamps as well. And then uh, if you say migrate down, uh, it's going to just drop the table. Here. Oh no, what happened here? That's why there's no there's no much power here. Not enough power? I wanted to charge the laptop but he doesn't want to charge from here. Hmm. I think there's not enough. Yeah, I think there's not enough. Too many too many you're not able to, you don't have, uh, you're not able to connect to this directly. Yes, you can, right? Yes, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is English, yes. Yeah. I forgot that I have English. I'm not sure if this still works. What's working actually? So I think it's because there's not an output here, because there's like this chaining. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry? Which is, uh, could you s scroll to the part where the subject book where we uh, drop database? Okay, so uh, could you go to the readme? If you want to jump ahead and go a little bit faster, you could go to our readme. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. so it's at number two uh, exercise. 
Ah, there we go. So, so you can yeah. you can start from here actually. So you uh, Pokédex dot drop table and create. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna do a more complex form later on. Hello. Oh yeah. What do we do when we get there? Uh, no such table. Okay, so. So what you have to do is to uh, have you installed uh, next yet? Yes. Okay, you have so I've done this thing. so. Oh, uh, I think you need to do run the migrate migrate up a command again. I think it's you're stuck there because he's complaining that the table is not set up. Uh, migrate up again. Yes. So it's really up to date. Can you run the test again? Uh, what do I do? Uh, yeah, run the test. Yeah. Uh, npm uh, test to run the test. Yeah. So now? Uh, npm test to run the test. Yeah, run. Do you have the second? You're you're not running the Pokédex test. So where where is your Pokédex test? This one, the, um, the one, the unit testing is out, no? Yeah. So we are testing the Pokédex mm -hmm. so that we can test the assertions. Mm, okay. So so uh, I think you can follow the readme where ah. continue from. Uh, this part over here. So you can continue from uh, this part over here. So testing promises. So you can write your test oh. for testing the Pokédex so that we can actually test the the database itself. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Um, your test is uh, testing, but then mine it's definitely the SQLite. Mm -hmm. I can quite open the SQLite. Uh, have you? Do you have the storage folder, or is or it yeah, says? Okay, so can you? I think it's dot slash, because you are running it at the root. Yeah. Okay, now if it says insert, you need to run the migration script to set up the the um database. So actually, the database has to be named test dot sqlite because it's configured to test the yeah. Oops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you need to run the migration scripts actually. So the migration script is uh, yeah, but change environment to test so that you are migrating the test and environment. Mm. Okay, you created a table, so you can run the test again. Yeah, it works. Yeah, if you run it again, you will get an error the second time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you planning to talk about the snapshot? Uh, it will be last. I think it will be after Epi tools. I'll try to actually skip some of the parts like callback so that. Okay. So I think maybe I'm in one hour. That, okay, I live in that in charge because now there seems to be charging, but only if it's closed. Mm -hmm. And I will come back in a okay. few minutes. Yeah, okay. Just go. okay. Oh. Okay. Are you unable to open database. So if uh, okay, so going back to your uh, test, uh, I think change this to one uh, dot slash. Yeah, because you're running oh. it. Uh, the root. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's why. Uh, yeah. No. no. So so uh, are you? Yeah, running at the root. So that. Okay. So if you get this error insert into, you need to run the migration and change the environment to test. Yeah. Yep. So run that. So it's really up to date. Can you run the run run your uh, test again? So okay. So so now okay. So uh, this reason is because you already added Pikachu to the database and it doesn't let you add another Pikachu. So the that's actually the next part that we're going to. But you can read the readme if you want to go faster to uh, clean up the database. This haven't do set up yet, right? No, no. Okay. So so. 
So if you are getting a error that says you can't insert to the database because po uh, Pokemon names is a unique, uh, uh, must be a unique value, that is intentional. If you keep running the test, Pikachu is already in a database because you had it in the first test. So what we have to do is to clean up the database and what Mocha does is uh, it gives you hooks. So we're going to use the hooks so that every time we run a test, we are going to drop the database and create it again. Yeah. So over here, before we, uh, we run our uh, Pokedex Dex test, we're going to say before everything. So the Poke, uh, there is actually a lot of hooks. There is um, the before hook. The after hook that runs once after or before and after all tests, and then there's a before each. But we're gonna we're gonna do uh, for before each so that we get a clean uh, clean setup for each of your your tests. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move our pokey decks to the top over here before uh, everything uh, I okay maybe actually I don't even so before uh, each test you're gonna connect to the database And uh, I believe we have a. Let me just check the. Oh, wait. we're going to call delete all. Uh, So we, uh, we can also just uh, close the Pokédex after, after each test just to just in case as well. So you're just going to run this again. Yeah. So, so now, now with the setup and tear down, it's going to drop the delete all the records uh, so that Pikachu is no longer the, the database. Every time you run the, data, the, the test, it will add Pikachu to a fresh new database where it, Pikachu wasn't there before. So now you wouldn't get uh you you'll get a clean environment to test with every time. Okay. So uh is anyone stuck so far? Okay. Okay, so uh we're gonna move on to testing your APIs then. So uh, let's start our, uh, our server so that we can test the APIs, uh, so that APIs are running so that we can test it. So to run our test, uh, we are going to run, I think we already run when this, so. OK, uh, run the migration test scripts again for the development environment so that when we start the test, uh, when we start our server, it's going to start in the development environment. So we're going to test that. Okay, so run your migration test for the uh, development environment. Uh, this time, there's an additional command. You have to run the seed command. So this is just going to run the seed file. That will add all the, uh, the first generation of Pokemon to the database so that when you get the API, there's something for you to work with. And do npm start. And now we have the uh, test on the uh, at port 3000. So you should be able to see this. Okay, so you should see your application loaded here. And the API we're going to test is uh, api.pokemon.pokemons. Yeah, 
So you should see uh, if you go to slash API slash Pokemon, you should see uh, I think about 151 Pokemons. So if you don't have uh, all these Pokemons, uh, you should raise your hands and get some help. into the uh, seeds.js, I'll just briefly explain it, is what it's going to do is it's going to go to the Pokemon database, it's going to delete everything, and then it's just going to read your Pokemon.csv file, which has a lot of Pokemons, but just your first gen Pokemons, and then it's just going to start uh, reading your CSV line by line and inserting it. So then we get all, all Pokemons. And every time you run the seed file, it's just going to drop everything and seed, seed it over and over again. So uh, let's try writing some API tests. So to write our API tests, um, there are uh, some plugins that you can put into Chai. There's, uh, so one of the nice things about Chai is that uh, it's very extensible. So there are a lot of uh, extensions for Chai that is useful. So let me just see where is our... <coughs> so so one, some of the useful plugins I've listed over here is uh, Chai HTTP, which I, we are going to use. Uh, there's also Chai JSON schema, which you can use to validate if the uh, response is looks exactly like the schema they expected. You can use uh, Chai DOM for testing DOM elements. You can say, oh, uh, grab this DOM element. Does the DOM element have the attribute of uh, name equals to a ABC? You can uh, use it to test your a uh, URL. So you can say, like, oh, is URL equals to slash API slash Pokemon, for example. You can also use it to test files. So you can say, uh, use the Chai file to test is, is the directory created with uh, this file. So, and uh, that's just for fun, there's a uh, chai doge. If you really want to do a very silly version of your chai, it's actually quite funny. So, chai doge, instead of saying uh, describe, it says such get tricks. Wow, very test. Yeah, so it's just for fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, let's start writing our, our API test. And before we write our API test, please install chai HTTP. And now we're going to start working from a new folder again. Uh, go to um, tools, uh, API test. And we're going to create a new, uh, we're going to import the chai HTTP um, to our, our application. OK, so. Uh, once you have installed Chai itself, you need to call chai.use chai HTTP to uh, use the plugin. We're okay, just going to copy that. And then we're going to do the same thing and describe. And uh, let's call uh, this API test. And then let's grab this and uh, let's test our get API Pokemon. And then it uh, should get 151 Pokemons. Okay, maybe it should retrieve.
So let's take a look at the Chai HTTP documentation itself. And uh, for to you to do a post request to Chai, uh, what you have to do is to say, okay, Chai dot request the base URL of the application, and then the path that you want to test. So let's just grab this, and our application is hosted at port three thousand. So let's just change this to three thousand, and uh, the we are gonna get the API Pokemon's uh, request. And then um, the last thing you have to do is to uh, do send send to perform the request itself. So this is also a uh, asynchronous uh, um, request. So you can either use uh, a callback, or uh, you can or you can uh, use promises to handle this. So chai dot request actually. Uh, returns both a callback. There's a callback version and there's a um, promise version. So let's just use the promise version. Say sync. And after you send it, we want to say, um, I believe it's a then. Then. So what you should do is, uh, you then you expect a response. Otherwise, if you if there's an error. Just throw the error out. So then now we can assert the uh, response itself. So if we look at um, what sort of assertions does um, uh, Chai support. So, so the Chai HTTP plugin, it extends the expect uh, syntax so that you can have expect to have status 1, 2, 3. So you just want to make sure that it has uh, status 2000 first. Then I'm gonna run our test again. Hmm. Okay. Expect is not defined. Uh, I'm missing something. Uh, the constant. Sorry? You need to get the uh, required child. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you have uh, yeah, I forgot to put that in. So I think my documentation is missing one part. So, um,. You need to uh, require the expect uh, library first from Chai, and then you call chai.use chai HTTP to use the plugin, and you extend the expect uh, library. Let's run the test again. So, tada! So, um, so we, we expect the, the response to give us back a 2000. We can also expect the, the response to be a. Uh, to have, I believe, let me, let, let's just test the haters. So let me cheat a bit and look at our solutions. So that's, uh, let's add this in. And uh, I'm gonna take a look at this. So there's a lot of assertions you can do on your request. You can say, okay, expect the status to be 2000, expect the header, we, we expect to have a content type header that should be a JSON in UTF-8 format. And uh, we wanna make sure that the response we get back is a JSON and the response body itself, we want it to be a type of array. And let's make sure that we have uh, 151 Pokemons actually. And the first Pokemon that we should get its name, it should be Bulbasaur. If it's in, not in this order, then it's, uh, our, uh, it's, not for, it's not correct because we seeded our data with the first Pokemon to be a Bulbasaur. Hmm. Okay, so I think I got a different, I think I have uh, seeded the wrong data for myself. So I actually have uh, 721 data. Uh, let me redo my
Okay, my seed file is kind of wrong because it's seeding me 721 Pokemon instead of 151. But I'm just gonna go with that and change my test. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So if you want to test a uh, post request, it's actually uh, pretty straightforward as well. So let's grab, uh, let's take a look at the solution for um, adding a Pokemon. So if you want to do, uh, you want to add a Pokemon instead. So you can actually just say post um, API, the, the API that you want, and then send the data over. And then you can do the same thing, you kind of expect, uh, let's just add like, there's mu1, there's mu2, let's add a mu3 over there. Just add this. And um, it will send the Pokemon, uh, the mu3 over to the API, create it. And then we expect the response to give us back the mu3 uh, Pokemon itself. And the body should contain a JSON with the name of the Pokemon being mu3. Okay. So similarly for our API test, because it's still interacting with our database, we want to set it up and tear it down again. Uh, we also don't want to always keep our, um, our database, uh, our web server to set it up. We want to automatically get the test to uh, start the server and to turn it off again. So to do this, what we can actually do is to use um, uh, Chai can actually automate, Chai HTTP can actually do this automatically for you. So all you need to do is to say, um, let's get the, let's just listen to your application. And then it was, uh, what it does is before each, it will start the server and uh, set, uh, shut it down. Instead of you having to say the port of the server is at 3000 and before you open, start run the test, you need to open up the server. So that's a little bit uh, of a two step process. So we're gonna uh, import our application. So cons uh, app equals to Require the server library. So we're going to import our application. And then instead of saying uh, uh, request the absolute URL, we're just going to say request the application. And uh, here it's requesting the application as well. And uh, let's just run this. Oh, app is not defined. Why am I having some indentation error? Okay, so this is uh, essentially the same as what we were doing before, but, but what it does is it will auto, uh, Chai will automatically turn on your server and turn it off uh, when you are done. So then we are gonna do, uh, I'll set up our hooks again. So. Um, to clean up our database as well. So before each, set out before each again. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are gonna, so previously we've been running our next migration script by hand in the command line, but we wanna be, we are developers, we wanna be as lazy as possible. We actually want the test to run the next migration script on, on its own. So what we can do is uh, we wanna uh, import next inside and uh, next, we wanna tell next to set up with the following configuration file, which is the uh, test environment configuration file. Uh, the configuration file is defined in the next file. I think the path here is uh, wrong. We might have to correct that. So the next file is defined in your root uh, itself. And the root uh, defines that the, the environment, the file name for development, uh, the file name for test, and the file name for production itself. So you just grab, uh, grab the uh, configuration from there. And then what we'll do is we'll run the rollback script. We're just gonna run your next migrate down, which simply just drops the database. And then uh, next migrate leaders actually uh, upgrades all your schema to the latest version of the migration. And then what we're gonna do is uh, before each of the tests, 
seed the database again. So when it seeds the database, it will just drop all the entries and put it back again. So just uh, I'm just going to copy and paste this and uh, put it here. And also remember to uh, import. So you don't need to import next because it's already here, but uh, we actually need to set the process to be test. So we just put it here. There you go. So this is what you sh it should look like when your, uh, your hook should look like. Let's run the test again. Test failed. Uh, it cannot destroy of undefined. Oh, next is undefined. Oh. Why is next undefined? going on here I'm not too sure why the previous code was complaining that next was undefined, but I just copied my solution and pasted it again. So um, try this out, and you should be able to um, retest your add function again and again. So we can actually try doing this two times just to be sure that um, we're going to try add new tool in two different tests, and it should uh, not throw us any error. Wrong, wrong one. So we're just going to try this just to make sure that it's okay. Yep. Here's my... Okay, for some reason I'm getting 151 instead. So 151 here. So I added the add Pokemon test two times on purpose just to make sure that the seed is working. So let me get my terminal again. <coughs> yep, so it's adding the Pokemon twice, but it's like no problem, like uh, the, the seed is working and it's clearing the database between each test. So there you go. Okay, so uh, is anyone stuck? Um, I'll give you guys about 10 minutes before we move on to end-to-end uh, -end testing. Yeah, please go toilet as well. And help us with company. You will probably run into some errors. So <laughs> ideally, uh, try to set it up and uh, so that we can save a bit of time. And then uh, if you need some help, you can go grab one of the uh, TAs around here. So it's over. Um, I can run a setup for exercise 3.2 if you have a bit of time. And uh, some notes about using Next. Uh, doesn't matter whether your project already uses Next for the database. 
you can just uh, use next on its own to see the database as well so that's uh, helpful enough for you to get some of the tests uh, seeded so so we have all your uh, backend covered with unit testing and um, in uh, API testing so let's uh, test your front end itself so for front end itself uh, we usually perform uh, user acceptance testing and one very um, strict way of defining acceptance testing is that the software meets business requirements but business requirements sounds very unrelatable so a better way to um, just define acceptance testing is does it work for the user okay so uh, one thing that we want to make sure uh, what, how we want to structure our acceptance test is like uh, user stories so a user story should contain the what the, the motive of the user like what he wants to do in the application and uh, if you want to just get started with uh, acceptance testing you go just kept cover all your happy flow first because each cases there can be a lot of them it can be very exhaustive but if you just want to get base coverage just do all your happy flow first and then uh, then we can cover uh, negative testing to make sure that uh, if your user makes mistakes because they are human, sometimes maybe they are just old, older folks like my grandparents or my parents and sometimes they will just not know how the UI works and do something wrong. Uh, the, the application should be helpful enough to give them an uh, appropriate error message so that they can recover. But that's uh, uh, neg again negative testing that is very exhaustive. So where if you want to start with uh, UI testing, it's very good to start with your happy flows first so that you, you don't get overwhelmed with uh, front-end testing. So there's actually many ways to test your front-end besides acceptance testing. There's also component testing, which we'll cover uh, later on. So uh, there are a few tools to set up uh, as, uh, your UI testing. So it, it can be very elaborate as well to set up your UI testing because if you think about it, um, your consumers are using your application in Chrome, in Firefox, Safari, IE, um, Edge, uh, then that's just the desktop. They will be looking at it in mobile, iPhone, Safari mobile, which is different from Safari desktop. And then you have all the Asian devices that have Vivo and then the Chinese browsers, that's the UC browser with the squirrel icon. So there is a lot of uh, infrastructure to set up. Uh, if you want to keep uh, keep things simple, uh, we can use uh, different tools. So there are uh, uh, providers like BrowseStack, like um, uh, SourceLab that provides you infrastructure so that you don't, don't have to think about it. Uh, if you want to DIY, which I will cover later on, you can do so as well. But uh, just fair warning, it's not a walk in a park because for me to write this, uh, create this <coughs> workshop, even though I'm experienced in setting up Selenium, it still took me two hours to set up Selenium because the documentation has changed in the last two to three years. So I had to figure out how to set up Selenium all over again for the latest version of Chrome and Firefox, etc. etc. So it's uh that that spec changes a lot and you really don't want to touch this if you if you can you should really try to avoid setting your own uh, Selenium up. So I'm just gonna do a demo of how you can uh, test uh, your eyelashes. Um, that's with Vialicious and uh, what we do as Vialicious is we provide uh, something like a code pen and for you to test your application so for what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna start our server again so let's start our server and we start and our oops I think I have something running yeah port 3000 is already in use sorry I have port 3000 open and the next thing you want to do is so uh, your analysis requires your application to be on uh, exposed to the internet to, to test it so what we're going to do is we're going to use ngrok which allows you to oops why is the interface looking like this ngrok so if you haven't already installed ngrok you can just do npm install ngrok there are other alternatives to ngrok uh, you can go ahead and start starting up hmm. So when you start up ngrok, it's going to expose your port 3000, so when you say ngrok HTTP 3000, it's going to uh, listen, it will set up a HTTP server that listens to port 3000 and gives you a public URL like this. So 
This is the public URL that I got, f228275.ngrok.io. And if I open that, it actually uh, loads this application, which is my own application itself. So if I actually turn off my application over here, um, let me go, let's do this one. Okay, it's still loading all the images. So if I turn it off and I load it, it's just going to say, oh, it's not there, the application is not there. And turn it on again. So once you have set that up, uh, it's going to take a bit of time to load all the assets again. Oh, so there's a, sometimes we'll complain that there's too many connections. Uh, it's probably too many connections because of the images. Uh, let me... Oh. Sorry? Oh, okay. I am actually going to set up an alternative because Ngrok, uh throttles the number of requests that you have. Let's see if this. Uh, yeah, just put yes. Okay. So, uh, if you're having trouble setting up Android, and Android is complaining there's too many connection. There's an alternative service called Servio, and what you need to do is just SSH R uh, AT to port localhost 3000 and Servio.net. So it's going to tell you that it is serving my traffic from this URL now. Oh, it's not working. You didn't start your node server. Oh, I didn't start my node server? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know I could serve you. Uh, slight tangent now, because I know quite a number of uh, laptops here were having timeout issues. So, uh, for your API test cases, or basically anything in the try, right? If you are having timeout issues for, for let's say, the initialization command, you can do before each this timeout. So the default is 2 seconds, uh, it, you can change 10 seconds. This method can be applied for any other API call add-on at your own use cases, like if something is like supposed to take 20 seconds or longer than expected, you can increase the default timeout. Uh, timeout because the, the examples that we are given does not take this into account because we kind of tested on our own hardware, so yeah. Yeah. Edit if you need it. Okay, so um, in our application here, it's loaded in this public URL, modus.servio.net. And uh, to test uh, this application, well, let's just test the search application. You can go to snippet.urlicious.com or you can just go to urlicious.com and click on create a test. So creating a test and running a test on urlicious is completely free and it's a lot like uh, doing code pen. There's a tutorial over here you can use. So what we are going to do is, uh, let me clear this. So the first step uh, we can do is just to go to our URL and just make sure that it's loaded. And the next thing you want to do is say, uh, fill in the name of uh, the Pokemon that we want to search. So we can say i.fill uh, name and let's look for a uh, New tool and I dot click. If you wanna go to, you wanna click on the search just to execute the search itself. So it's taking a bit of time to load up the server. And uh, when you're done uh, searching it, we wanna see I dot C just to do an assertion that the number of results found is uh, one. So if you look at, uh, let me go to the Pokédex. We say you know, two. Oh, there's no Pokemon called Mew Two. Okay, it's a space actually. Uh, without the space, Mew Two without the space. So I loaded the application. So don't really have to think about. Okay, I want to um, set up my Chrome. And what we want to do is uh, make sure that we actually see one Pokemon. And now we want to make sure that we see um, Mewtwo as the Pokemon itself and 
maybe we just want to assert that that Pokemon that we see is a psychic Pokemon. Or um, you could just say assert that the HP is uh, 160 for example. So let's say HP 106. So you can go ahead and run that. And uh, what it's going to do uh, behind the scenes is it's going to call infrastructure which is managed by my CTO which is Eugene. I call him Eugene as a service because he abstracts infrastructure for me. So Eugene as a service is EAAS which is S. Badass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it would actually set up the test in our backend and start the Chrome, uh, the, the Chrome in uh, Docker, or if you, in the case of ID or Edge or Safari, it's going to start a VM. That's why uh, sometimes it takes a while to accept, uh, start up a browser. Now actually the browser is start up, but uh, it's taking a bit of time to load the application itself because there are 702 Pokemons itself. So what UIlicious does is that it actually waits for an application to be fully loaded before it starts uh, running the next steps. And uh, some interesting bits about UIlicious is that you don't need to figure out what the the uh, ID of the uh, the name field is. You don't need to figure out what is the uh, what's the search the ID of the search button is. You just need to say, okay, I click on search. Uh, and okay, I click on uh, name uh, is equals to Mewtwo. So what your does is it was gonna look for the if it, when you say I dot field name, it's gonna look for the occurrence of name on the on your DOM HTML and uh, a DOM element. And uh, if it finds uh, name, it's just gonna search around it uh, in, within the DOM tree, or it's gonna do a, a search uh, around the, in the DOM tree the elements that occur visually around the name. Uh, text itself, and we find the text info field is just gonna make an intelligent guess that okay, that name field is probably related to this word name, and that is probably the label for this input field itself. So um, you don't have to write perfect HTML code to be able to run tests on UIlicious. In fact, um, you can write pretty crappy code, and uh, UIlicious can try to make its best guess on what you mean when you say oh, fill in the search uh, name field. And uh, you can, it, it will be very simple to write tests because you don't need to think about uh, what your CSS is. So, so if, even if someone changed the CSS for your search button or they changed the CSS for your name field, then um, there's no, uh, the, the test wouldn't break. And uh, another thing about uh, the behavior, so, so this is a server-side uh, application. The, uh, is actually very good at handling uh, asynchronous components well. So it works with any framework that, for example, if you are using uh, Angular, React. In fact, we use Uilicious to test Uilicious itself, which is built on Vue. So, so some meta la layers of testing. We use Uilicious to test Uilicious, which tests on other websites. So there's like three layers of testing. Yeah. So it will still work. Uh, it will automatically, if you have an asynchronous com uh, component, it will automatically wait for uh, the component to be loaded for up to 15 seconds. So you can actually configure the timeout. So if you are working on blockchain, for example, and for some reason you need the test to wait 10 minutes for the process to be completed, you can just say command dot set uh, timeout, uh, command timeout to be equals to 15. So we, we have, we do cover a lot of commands over here. You can say you could test uh, drag and draw, you could test uh, status code as well. Uh, filling in the field, um, scrolling, <coughs> clicking, accepting alerts. So it's pretty easy. So if you want to change the timeout, you can say, okay, timeout is 15 seconds. Okay, so it's pretty simple to set up a test on your dishes, but of course, um, we want to figure out how to do this on our own as an exercise. So what we can do, if you want to DIY this, is uh, you need to set up Selenium and you need to install a web driver library itself. So, so the, for, for browser automation, um, there is a standard called the uh, web driver protocol and it's a standard that is specified by the WC3 community uh, that specifies how the browser should implement their drivers for test automation. So you can think of this as uh, printers and your Selenium library as the printer dialog. So your uh, Selenium library just gives you a common interface for you to write the commands and you interface with the Chrome driver and for Firefox there is a Gecko driver and a Marionette driver and for Safari there's Safari driver, i.e. there's IE driver but uh, sometimes they don't follow the specs 
So uh, it is it is up to you to discover how the browsers don't follow the specs. Like uh, sometimes when they open up the select menu, uh, Safari will just freeze. So uh, you sometimes you need to figure that out on your own if you want to use Selenium on your own. But uh, let's try that anyway. Um, if you want uh, to, so let's move on to exercise three point two and try setting up Selenium on your own. The fastest way to set up Selenium uh, on your computer is to use Selenium standalone, which knows where are all the URLs to download your Selenium drivers from. So we can go ahead and say, okay, npm install Selenium standalone. Oh, a new browser, a new tab. Uh, just a quick word of warning regarding this because because this command is not exactly 100% stable across all environments so if any of you have any selenium setup issues I will try to go to you also take note this command is not exactly meant for production so if anyone wants to know how to configure selenium for production or environment X I can speak to you separately because uh, the setup steps for IE11 is completely different from AH is completely different from Chrome so we actually wanted to actually cover that on a yeah, it's different. Uh, setting up Selenium is different for um, Mac, different on Linux, different on uh, Windows machines as well. So it gets a bit complicated. So once you have done your npm install Selenium standalone, you can do uh, Selenium standalone oh. install. So Selenium standalone install is going to uh, install some default drivers. It's going to install your Selenium driver, uh, Selenium server. It's going to install your Chrome driver, and it's going to install your Firefox drivers. And uh, right now, it's just taking the latest of each of the drivers. And then uh, next thing, what we want to do is to install a whole bunch of things that we want uh, from uh, Web Driver IO. So WebDriver IO is an implementation of uh, it's a library that uh, interfaces with the WebDriver protocol. So it's gonna instruct all the different. Uh, it's gonna set up the the browsers for you, and it's gonna uh, shut it down for you, and it's gonna send the commands to the browsers. So you can take a look at the API on uh, at your leisure. But we're just gonna do something simple like uh, search for Pokemon again. So install the bunch of stuff over here. Uh, I'm gonna use the Mocha framework as well. And then the step two is I uh, copy over the the WIO config from sample.js to uh to uh, uh you, you can or you can just rename it from sample.js to to wdio.config. So you can just rename this. So let me just um run through what we have set up over here. So over here, uh, we have uh, the runner, uh, we are going to run WebDriver, a local uh, instance of WebDriver IO. And uh, it's going to point to the test that we have defined in uh, part three, end-to-end uh, -end test. And over here, we have defined, okay, we have a maximum instance of 10. And uh, our capabilities that we have on this machine that we have should be one instance of uh, Firefox and one instance of Chrome. And uh, we are just going to log out uh, our info. You can, uh, if, you, if you find it very noisy, you could just set it to error. So you just at least know uh, when, some, when Selenium fails. And um, it's going to use connect to Selenium standalone. And uh, we're going to use Mocha as well, so that it's uh, more consistent. Yeah, And that's pretty much. And, and also, we need to. Uh, so, so we are actually not going to use uh, Mocha as the the drive uh, the the test runner. So we're going to use WDIO as the test runner itself. So WDIO, you need to tell it to import Chai again. So in the before statement, you need to do the same thing as what you usually do in the at the top. Uh, import Chai Chai global dot expect uh, Chai equals to expect, and also you can do Chai dot shoot, which would uh, extend the uh, object or prototype with this shoot uh, language chains. Okay, so then the last part, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do uh, start writing our search Pokemon test. So this is uh, gonna be a little bit. Uh, uh, we're gonna set set up our define our scripts again. So let's describe our end end to end test. Let's 
describe our uh, so I'm going to just put in the test again it should uh, search for new to and uh, actually all browser tests they are um, asynchronous but if you use WDIO as a runner instead of uh, web driver on its own so, so web driver runs in two modes it can actually run in a synchronous mode and it can run in synchronous mode so we are going to get um, try to uh, WDIO to run in synchronous mode I can't remember if there's a flag over here but it will run in synchronous mode so we don't have to think about uh, your awaits again and um, what WDIO exposes to you is the browser object itself so we can take a look at the API so if you want to the, the most basic thing we should do is just to go to a URL so the simplest command is just browser.url URL itself so we're just going to grab that and let's just go to localhost 3000 And uh, we can just grab the title of the browser just uh, to try make sure that we have do some kind of basic assertion maybe browser browser dot get title and uh, what we can do is uh, expect again title to be kidex. So if you want to run the test, uh, because I've set up the end-to-end te -end test to run with a different uh, test runner, instead of running with uh, Mocha by itself, it will run with uh, WDIO. We actually need to set up a different uh, script for testing. So you need to run the test, dot, uh, test colon E to E. So run E to test colon E to E. So let's go back here. So I should kind of expect, um, so it's running in Firefox and Chrome and over at a, so if you're running tests on localhost, the trouble is that you cannot touch your machine when it's running its test because it's gonna interfere with the test itself. But what you have seen previously is that it just starts the Chrome browser and the Firefox browser in parallel and starts executing the command. And you can see it's very fast as well. It will just uh, open up the browser, get the title, close it. So sometimes you might not be able to see what's happening. And on top of that, uh, the screenshots are another set of commands itself. But you have to DIY the screenshots if you want to do that. So I think I have some trouble with this. Expect, hmm, I'm doing something wrong. Ah, it's not to be. It's uh, to be equal. Pokédex. So I run that again. There you go. So we have two uh, tests passing. We are just going to go to that URL and expect the title to be Pokédex. So that's a little bit boring. We want to do a little bit more stuff. So let's do something like uh, fill in the few. So browser. So to, to fill in a few, what you need to do is to send uh, the value. You need to use the send uh, where is that value set value command itself so you need to grab the you need to select the um, element that you want to interact with and then set the value itself so to select the so if you're using uh, web driver or most uh, libraries they will expect you to provide a CSS selector or XPath selector so over here in our uh, application the the Pokemon uh, the Pokemon name field is actually type uh, has the id of pokemon's dash search dash form dash name dash input so we're going to grab that and we're going to say like okay 
grab this id and dot set value to be mu2 and the next thing we have to do is to say okay we need to click on that button uh, we need to click on the search button which is this button with this particular id pokemon dash search dash form dash submit dash btn and the command to click on it is uh, click it's just click so after you select it you click on it the click and then uh, what we're going to do is uh, the next steps would be actually uh, get the to check the Pokemon card itself to see whether it has the, the text uh, Mewtwo so Pokemon uh, okay let's just take a look at this hmm. okay just gonna be a little bit lazy here and just just test for the Pokemon count itself so the Pokemon count is inside a class uh, a, a, a bow element with the class Pokemon count so we're just gonna get Pokemon count and um, get text so get text is gonna get the value of Pokemon to a, a variable so count and we're just gonna say expect uh, count to be equal one so one is in text because when you get text it will give you a text it's not going to be a number unless you do parse text and we're going to run this again in chrome and firefox Yeah, so it's super fast. Maybe you guys have missed it when it actually access uh, when it's completed the Pokemon uh, completed the search. So I'm gonna run this again, but you can see that it's passing. So it got grab the text, uh, grab the count, and asserted that it's equals to one. So you can eyeball this for a moment. It's gonna feel you to click on search and uh, grab the text and close it. So it's super fast. So uh, this doesn't give you a screenshot, so if you want to make sure that everything passes, you either look at the console. If something goes wrong, you need to run the test again and eyeball it until it's done. Yeah, so that's how you set an uh, end-to-end -end test on your own. And if you want to have more questions about setting up the Selenium server on Edge, on Safari, on IE, you can talk to Eugene. Where's Eugene? Eugene, yes. If you ever want to test other browsers. Okay? So that's uh, basically the end of um, our workshop for end-to-end uh, -end testing. I'm actually going to get our guest, um, Jill. You want to show uh, Applitools? So Applitools uh, is a visual regression testing tool. I will let um, Jill introduce visual regression to you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah? Um, oh, the number of UI testing tools, right? Yes. Wait, I need to be faster. So, uh, I mean, brand and side has to be, what should we consider between the different frameworks? So what should you consider between a different framework? Uh, you should first of all look at the browser support. So one of the very popular ones uh, you will hear of, and in fact I think Jill will show you, is uh, Cypress. So Cypress uh, supports only Chrome. So if you want to test uh, Firefox, you're kind of out of luck with Cypress. And then um, Cypress actually doesn't use the web driver protocol. Uh, it uses the Chrome Dev 2 protocol, which is why it's lightning fast. So if you want performance and you don't care about testing other browsers besides Chrome, then Cypress might be a suitable tool. Uh, the thing about most other testing tools compared to UIlicious is that you need to uh, ID or add a class for every single one of the elements that you want to test. So if you want to test the search button, you can't just say test, uh, uh, you can't just say add a click search because it doesn't really work. You actually need to explicitly say select the button with the ID, uh, search dash form dash login uh, dash submit dash button then dot click. 
So the so the syntax can be very verbose. Uh, I think it's really up to you to check each and every one of the frameworks to see whether you're comfortable with it. The other one is another difference is um, some some tools actually like Nightmare JS. If I remember, uh, they want you to add a async await for every single one of the commands. So maybe you don't like async await that much. So so there's very small uh, differences between the style of writing your tests. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, sorry. Okay. Can I pin this on you first. Oh, yeah. okay. Can you hear? Oh, so it's just. Um, I'm not going to talk about ES modules now. I'm going to talk about my favorite subject, which is testing. Uh, I come from Apple Tools. I have about 20 minutes before I rush to the airport and, and go back home, the other home. Um, but, so I want to really do a, a, an explanation of what visual testing is about and uh, then uh, do, do a quick demo of, of how, how we do it uh, at Apple Tools. So uh, first of all, um, uh, what is visual testing? Uh, WebDriver.io, which you're going to use in a second, and Cypress and Selenium WebDriver and lots of others do functional testing. What does that mean? Uh, you click on a button, you check that the button does what it, it's supposed to do, right? Uh, you click on Add to Cart, you check that the uh, item was added to cart. You click on this, you check that. So you're basically clicking on stuff or write, uh, typing stuff and then checking lots of elements on the page to ensure that the functionality works correctly. But as somebody tweeted about a month ago, look, my CSS didn't load, the page looked like shit, yet all my functional tests passed. Okay, which is true. We don't care the, your tests. You've tested your unit code, your, 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 your business logic. Your, you've tested your API logic and your integration with the database. You've tested the functionality of your front end code. What about, so you've tested all your code except two, stop, two parts, the HTML and most importantly the CSS. None of the functional tests test the CSS. None of the functional tests test how your brow, I mean, how your application looks like. And that is as important, well, not as important, but almost as important as functional testing. And in these days of responsive design, you're mostly web developers, I'm guessing. Who has, whose application is responsive? Okay, responsive as in supports multiple widths. Right, an increasing number and it's going to grow more and more. Okay, now I've seen a lot of developers change the CSS and then do this with the browser, right? And then change the CSS and then do this with the browser to check that all, but are you really checking or are you just, yeah, it looks okay, okay? We're not really checking, we're definitely not checking all the minor variations. And I was talking here at JSConf Asia to a designer and he says, yeah, come on, some guy changed the CSS and the button like moved three pixels to the left. And I notice it because I'm a designer and I go to the developer and the developer says, come on, what do you care about three pixels? Developers, <laughs> we don't see that. Okay, we do not see that and we need to see that. And if we do it manually again and again and again and again, we won't see that, we will get tired, which is what visual testing is all about. Okay, so visual testing is all about looking at the, af uh, the visual aspects of your application. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy doing that. Uh, I have a talk, I did a talk at, JS, uh, at CSSConf, uh, talked about the four elephants in the room. There are four main problems in, in CSS. One, first of all, how does, sorry, wait, uh, I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I have totally, this is the beauty of, of, of a conference, you know, uh, 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 she came to me and said, hey, I have a testing workshop, why don't you do a demo? I said, okay. So I came totally unprepared, I will do a demo, it will be nice, but sometimes I'm going to jump like crazy. Um, so, um, how do we do visual testing? A lot of people come to me and they went in the, to the booth and they think that we look at a screenshot, we look at the page and say, yeah, this looks good, right? Uh, we don't do that, we don't do that. Other people think that we feed a design system into our, into our application, like the margins should be this, the fonts should be this, etc., etc., and then we check the page for correctness. We don't do that either. It's basically impossible because 
the rules are so huge that you're basically rewriting the CSS again. Uh, what we do is what we call visual regression testing. We change that what was still is. We're changing that nothing, we're, we're testing that nothing changed between the last time and the next time. And, and the next guest will also be talking about uh, snapshot testing, uh, which is not visual, and which basically checks that the HTML itself, the HTML elements, the divs and the spans and that, doesn't change from run to run. We're doing the same, but we're doing it visually. So running a test in visual is very similar to WebDriver IO. Okay, you run the test, you, uh, you click, click, click using browser automation, okay, in the test, you say navigate to this page and then click on this and then click on that. You take a screenshot. The first time the test runs, that screenshot is the baseline. This is what should be. You look at it manually, you let the designer look at it manually, they, they all say, yeah, we're okay. And then the next time the test runs, we compare the screenshots, okay? If they're the same, the test passes. If they're not the same, two things can happen. Either it's a bug, which is what usually happens. Yay, it's a bug. We found a bug. We're good. We fixed the CSS. We're done. Or, well, it's a feature. If it's not a bug, it's a feature, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a feature. We added things. We changed the styling according to the design. So we need to approve it. Approving it means accepting it as the new baseline. Okay, so that is how visual testing works. Click, click, click using browser automation, screenshot, click, 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 screenshot. We do lots of screenshots on all the states of the application or specific to components. We can do also component testing and then compare the screenshots to the previous screenshots. If there's a problem, we alert and you can tell us whether it's a bug or a feature. That is basically. But what is, what is, what's the problem? There are many OSS tools that do that. There are a couple of problems. First of all, if you're using WebDriver I.O., behind the scenes, you're using Selenium. Selenium, for reasons I cannot understand, uh, chose not to do full page screenshots. So every time you take a screenshot, you're using Selenium, you're taking only the viewport, the window. So if you want to do a full page screenshot, you need to do the scrolling stuff, and it's really, really complicated. Okay? So taking a screenshot using Selenium is very difficult. All the other tools, really easy. Uh, that's the one elephant. It's not a big elephant, but it's still an elephant. The other one is the comparison. Comparing one a Mac version from a Windows version is basically impossible. Comparing Chrome 74 to 73 is difficult. Comparing Chrome 74 to Chrome 74, same machine, different GPUs, doesn't work. And why? Because each one of them renders stuff just a little bit differently. There are anti-aliasing stuff, with the way you render JPEGs, all kinds of weird things, and you start getting false positives. You start getting false positives, and you start moving the slider. Zero error rate, which is false positives, or I accept 5% error rate, or 10% error rate, and you keep moving that slider to the right, and what do you start getting? False negatives. Okay? So you choose the slider, how much false positives or false negatives you want. That's the second problem. What, what Applitools does is we have a team of four uh, algorithms people that all they do is deal with visual algorithms that do diffing. It is possible. It's complicated, very complicated, but we've basically solved that problem of visual diffing between screenshots. Um, the third is managing those screenshots. If you're doing a lot of screenshots and you have 50 and you're changing the header, now you need to check that all the header changes and all the screenshots are exactly the same. Okay? Um, you have to go through each one of those screenshots and, and, and manage that and accept this and reject that and do all kinds of stuff. So managing those screenshots is a problem. The fourth one I think is the more, mo most pro problematic. You, want to you don't want to check, you want to run the test on Chrome, but you want to check it on Chrome, on Firefox, on iPhone with, on iPad with, on desktop with. You have CSS breakpoints. You want to check them on each one of those breakpoints. How do you do that and keep your tests running in, in like, in not running hours, but running minutes, okay? How do you do that? That's for me the biggest problem. So let, let's, uh, let's, let's see a test. Let's see how we solve those problems, and then I run to the airport. Okay, so this is the WebDriver I.O. test. 
Okay, um, should I make it bigger? Yep. There we go. Now, I'm not going to run it because we still don't support WebDriver IO5 uh, Apply Tools, and, and this is WebDriver IO5, so I'm going to show you the code, but I'm going to run it under Cypress. But it's the same thing. Okay, so what we do, let's ignore the eyes thing. Apple Tools eyes is the visual testing tool. Eyes, you get the metaphor. It's, right, it's actually really cute. I like it. Uh, Browser.url navigates to that URL. And then we click on the checkbox called Dragon. I want to filter and show only the Dragon Pokemons. I don't understand Pokemon, so I may be wrong here. <laughs> okay? uh, but I need to catch them all, right? Okay. Uh, and then I click on the Form Submit button. Okay? I click on it so that it submits the shirts. It leaves me with only the Dragon Pokemons. And then I take a screenshot. I take a screenshot and compare it to the previous, to the baseline screenshot. Then I click on a specific card, click on the card, and take another screenshot. This is basically what I do. I also in, in initialize eyes, and I do an open session and a closed session. That's not very interesting. In Cypress, it's exactly the same, but, but differently. Oh, wait, I want to, wait, 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 there we go. It's exactly the same, but differently. Instead of dollar, you get site.get, click, click, but it's the same test. So let me run. This is running Cypress. So, by the way, if you install Cypress or WebDriver or whatever tool, if you want to add eyes functionality, you just npm install eyes, and, and then you have the new uh, command. So, but all tools are exactly the same. I mean, if it's eyes, if it's other commercial tools, if it's open source tools, they all do the same. This is, this is Cypress. It's a really cool tool. Uh, and, and we're running. Notice that the test is finished running, but, the, but we're, all, we're still running because in the background, we're comparing all the screenshots and making sure that everything's OK. It should take about 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Well, yay, 20 seconds. Uh, OK, now what do I want? I want eyes. To check, uh, the test passed, OK? But I can look at the screenshots. Uh, nope. And this is Pokemon, and I have the scre three screenshots here, the two screenshots. This is one screenshot, and this is the second screenshot. Okay? We're taking full page in this case, Chrome 74, 1024 by 768. Perfect, I've seen the screenshots. Now, we talked about the whole responsive width stuff, so let's, let's do something else. We've tested it under Chrome 1024 by 768. Let's add some more Chromes, like 800 by 600, 1900 by 1800. Let's do some Firefox stuff and IE. OK, so now we have, oh, uh, let's do a Chrome emulation of iPhone X and iPad. OK. And run the test. Cypress is very annoying and that I save and it immediately starts running the test because it's really fast. Uh, it is really fast. So uh, I'm running it. I've now, instead of two screenshots, I have like about 40 to 30 screenshots for all the responsive widths and all the different browsers, okay? It should take roughly the, um, the same amount of time. It's still 25 seconds. Let's look at the... Um, Amplitude's eyes stuff. And there we go, the Pokemon. You can see it running on all these browsers the same amount of time. Uh, now, um, as you can see, here we have, uh, this is a bit too big, IE 11, 10, 1280 by 1024. Let's look at smaller one. You can see that the responsive design works. Here we have three columns. And here we have four columns, OK? So we're basically testing responsive design using this application. 
but all the screenshots, all the renderings, not the test, the test is running on this machine once, but all the screenshots and all the renderings are running on what we call the visual grid so that it uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, run the test. We do not run the test themselves. That's for UILicious, that is for browser stack, etc., etc. If you want to do cross-browser functional tests, don't come to us. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so that is uh, uh, the, 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 the thing. Let's, let's do a bug. Let's add a bug, um, a, a visual bug. Let's change the CSS. Oh, look, I'm exactly the what I want. Inst the color, the submit button, the search button, instead of this, I'll do uh, purple, whatever. And save. And rerun the test. It should take, again, roughly the same amount of seconds. Running through all those browsers, all those responsive widths. And let's go to eyes. Running. There we go. We found diffs. Let's look at them. They're all in the same place. Uh, we can do the cool demo thing, OK? Um, but if we look at it, it's exactly that problem. Uh, I'll remove this. You can see the baseline and the checkpoint. You can see the difference between. Now notice, uh, uh, now, now I can, uh, oh, wait, wait there's the, the, the really cool feature. No, not, not demo, it's a, it's a really, really, OK. Now. What caused this bug? Some CSS or HTML change. But what we can do, sorry, why am I doing this? Is click here, or not, sorry. Let's start again. Click here, what we will see is not just a visual diff, but a CSS and HTML diff. We're seeing the bug. Okay? We, because what we do, because we're running all the tests in the background, we're getting all the HTML and the CSS to show the screenshots, we can diff it. Once we diff that HTML and CSS, we just, you know, this, this is the bug. This is what caused this visual, this specific visual diff. Okay? If we had different diffs, each click would show you the different diff that caused this bug. No idea how this works. Uh, that's why we have a four people uh, algorithm team uh, to do this kind of magic. But it, it is magic and it would work. The last thing is, don't forget, we need to approve or disprove it to, or, or reject the change. We can do it one by one or we can group all the changes and let Apple tools tell us, hey, this is all the changes. It's just the same change, just approve or reject it uh, once. As you can see, it's not infallible. It, it, it did it into three groups because it's not, you know, it's, it's still only four people algorithm team uh, and not a 10 people algorithm team, but it will get better. And three is much better than like 30. Uh, so, so we're good here. We can accept or reject the change. Uh, and then continue on. So this is the basics of visual testing. Write a test using WebDriver I.O., whatever tool you have, add using whatever tool, OSS, or, or open source or commercial, add those checks to check the screenshot. It will check against the baseline, and then if there are diffs, you need to approve and reject the changes. This is the base of visual testing. I think it's uh, one of the important tools in your tool to set as testing. And thank you very much. Yes, right now. So I try to keep things very, very shortly. Um, yesterday, we were talking about testing. And she discovered who it was and asked me to do a little introduction of snapshot test because it's not included in the, uh, it was not included in the, component testing, snapshot testing, but I couldn't figure it out how to set it up for a uh, part, and I thought you needed to use React to set it up, so I gave up until you came along. I will, I will, <laughs> I will explain this now. 
So just a little question. Who here has ever used Jest before? Oh, very few people, actually. OK. So basically, Jest is a test framework which is written um, in Facebook. And a lot of people that use React use Jest to test their uh, UI code. Um, I'm here to talk about the snapshot test feature we implemented three years ago now in Jest. Um, and despite being implemented in Jest, there are other frameworks that took the code from Jest because it's all release open source and all is uh, in a monorepo, so a lot of part can be reused. And I think Ava has implemented. So if you use Ava, you may be able to use it. I'm not sure about the other, like um, Mocha, but well, I will try to explain how it works in Jest because that's what I know better. So why the snapshot test first? Um, we wanted to test UI because that's what all UI developers want to do, right? The problem we would do that is that the only solution that kind of work is end-to-end -end testing. Hand to end testing has some issue because in order to do like the basic end to end test, you need to first open a browser, wait for the browser to load, navigate to the page, wait for the page to load, wait for the um, DOM to be ready, select some element, usually like a text or a button, do some interaction with the button, wait for animation to finish or some API to be called. And then if everything didn't break, do a screenshot of that. And then run this test over and over to see the difference like we see before in the previous um, talk. Now, this is also very slow because all these things need to happen in order to have the screenshot. Um, if for running one test it takes 30 seconds, running thousands of tests will take a lot of time. And the web developer usually don't want to wait that much in order to ship their code. Um, so we thought, what if we think uh, what we want really to test? UI usually is a function of your input, and it generates the same output, right? And in React, uh, there is the virtual DOM concept, so all the UI is a tree. But this doesn't really apply only to React. You apply to <coughs> In Vue.js, for example, it's the same. Or even if you use anything, like in the example uh, of today is only server-side render. But at the end of the day, when you call the index page, it will generate the same HTML. So if you can take that tree or that um, output of our function and somehow serialize it and store it, we can compare on the next run. and since we can do that without connecting to a browser, uh, we just need to check that that code works once by visually looking at that and then accepting our output. And when we run the second time, if we find anything is wrong, it will tell us before even we run on the browser uh, because it can compare with the previous output. And just is able uh, through snapshot test to catch all these things. Um, now imagine if we have multiple developers working on uh, different teams and they share a common UI component library, for example. Um, and everyone is happy and is using like a button. Some, but somehow someone in a different department decide that <coughs> The normal button doesn't work anymore. They want that to be purple and with like, I don't know, rainbow on the bottom. And so we change the UI component for, for them because they want that. It works for them and it's perfect for them. But they don't know that a department in a different place is using the same component. And when they run their test, everything works because they run their test, right? Um, but of course, after deploying, the other department say, what's happening here? Everything is broken. Why is my button now like this? Um, now, if you have like a very small snapshot test for each component, each base component, you can avoid this, because when the department changes the button, 
it runs all the tests. And it runs all the tests uh, in the UI components library. And it will be able to catch that uh, another, another part is uh, using that and is maybe not the case to change everything and can revert that. Otherwise, if you say, oh, do you like that button? You can just talk to them and say, oh, yes, we like that as well. You can just proceed, right? So this is, how, this is why we build the snapshot. And snapshot is not just for UI. You can apply that to everything. Everything is a function. Um, you can run that function. You have an output. You can run through a serializer and get an output. One example of this is, I don't know if anyone here has used Prettier before. Do you know Prettier? Um, Prettier has used snapshots for their uh, test case. So what they do is basically Prettier is a linter that automatically change your code to apply some rules and rewrite that so everyone is using the same rules and uh, there's no more comment, oh, you forgot the space here, you forgot uh, uh, this parenthesis should be there instead of there. Um, in order to do that, they run a lot of case, they write, uh, they write some JavaScript, they feed the JavaScript to Prettier, and then they generate the output. And by using snapshot test, they can compare all the input and the output, and when they change, they can see regression immediately without even, um, even have to run against like all the code base. So I have prepared a very little example of this. Hopefully it will work. <laughs> um, this is not uh, perfect because I hacked that together in a few hours. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think that will work anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is oh, oh, sorry. So basically, I took the example that everyone is uh, was looking at today, and I create a um, test for just solution that oops that basically rewrite the test using just. Uh, and the only difference is that 2B is like 2B capitalized instead of 2.B. There's basically uh, just use uh, expect from, uh, you can use expect in other framework as well. You can download from NPM. And so the, the way you write the expectation is slightly different, not that much different. And I wrote uh, just the first two and then I rewrote the end-to-end -end test that there was, um, and I tried to make, this is overly complicated, because you don't need to do this, of course. <coughs> but in order to show up what you can do with Jest, uh, just allow to mock things. So in this case here, I mock express router. So when we um, register the route, it will save the route, and then we can call the route directly uh, on the unit test. And being a unit test, it means it doesn't have to spawn a browser, it doesn't have to wait, it just call it. Usually you don't do this, by the way, you just export the model and include the model and run the model. But in this case, I just want to show up, uh, to show that it's possible to, um, in any uh, different, different occasion, you might have different configuration, different <coughs> uh, library like Vue. Uh, it all works differently. But in this case, there's no React. There's no JavaScript in the framework. It's just server-side render. So what I did here was just to show that um, we render the, the application. The applic this application uses PugJS, which is <coughs> a template library. So it just rendered through Pug. And then, just for fun, I load that to Cheerio, which is kind of jQuery for Node.js, um, in order to show that you, the title is Pokedex. Just to, exp just to show that before showing the snapshot, 
uh, I want to show what usually we do. We just search for something and look that is correct, search for something else and look at this correct. So this is using what the server side returns. And at the end, it just snapshot um, everything. So when I run this, it generates a folder called snapshots. And it saves the snapshot here. Um, <coughs> sorry. And basically, this is the output of the snapshot. And it's human readable, because I parsed this through JS Beautifier. So since it's HTML, it just prettified the HTML. So everyone can just check this if you have a in a in GitHub, you will see that, um, like, very, uh, I, sorry, let me change it here. If I do HTML, for example, you will see it like this, for example, and then it's very easy to compare with what is your expectation of. Um, and if your expectation is correct, then you can proceed. Um, and just usually is very, very fast, but here I'm running uh, under bash on Windows, which makes everything slower <coughs> because of the way bash on Windows 1 works. From bash on Windows 2, which will be released soon by Microsoft, it will make this like order of magnitude faster because all the file system API right now pass through a security level. So each time you open a file, it's very, very slow. But still, it takes like um, eight seconds for running this end-to-end -end test. Um, if I now change the test, so in this test I had to mock the process and to be production because the database is only available for production in this machine. If I now change the test like this <coughs> and rerun, I can show you, maybe you can zoom, or maybe not. So now it's running the same test uh, again. Um, but this time, it should not be able to find the database. And oh, in here, actually here is, is failing on the first expectation because there is no Pikachu anymore. <coughs> Sorry, my voice. So I will just show the snapshot because otherwise it doesn't run. I have to fill this time because waiting 10 seconds to run all the tests is very boring. OK, so now here we have uh, the diff, the visual diff of what's happening. So we can see that the previous snapshot uh, <coughs> had all this data, but now there is nothing here because these are all removed and this is all the add. And we can see here there's zero Pokemon instead of finding Pikachu because right now it's not connecting to the database. And immediately I know that there is something wrong here because, and I can see what is wrong here. If instead, uh, let me check. Let me change this back so it connects to the database again. And search for Charizard. I never run this test, I don't know if it works. And also right now I'm running uh, just all the time manually, but you can run in watch mode. So as soon as you save, you will run the test and show immediately, and it's very, very fast. <coughs> so I suggest to try that. And now here we can see that the difference is uh, oh, it's still not finding the Pokemon. But anyway, the difference, um, I think it's not, sure, it's, it's not written correctly, but it shows all the difference between previously and currently. So 
My point is that Jest uh, gives you this ability to do snapshot tests. Uh, I just want you to know that it's possible to use this also in other framework. Uh, there are some catches, for example, uh, if you have something, you render something with the current time, for example, that wouldn't work normally because if you snapshot now, in, it will only work now and not like in a second. Uh, you can mock that just as, out, uh, as uh, uh, very good mocking support. So it's very easy to mock dates, to return always the same date. Um, sometimes this might be a bit too uh, noisy. Uh, in that case, you can write a different serializer to remove the part that changed a lot, that you don't really care if it's changing or not. Um, but overall, it's a good solution. And I'm using this right now. I'm working in Rakuten, and we use this a lot. Uh, we also, uh, basically, a lot of UI developer have um, some UI component library, and they use something like style guide or something similar to that. Um, and basically, when you do that, um, you have this website where it shows your component in, uh, with different uh, vari variants. For example, if you have a button with the icon or without the icon, uh, you can just see that in a, you spawn up um, this website and see <coughs> <coughs> sorry, st uh, with Storybook or Style Guidist, you can see the component in all the variants. And since you already instruct how to render that component, you can run just snapshot on that. And that was what, what we do. There are for um, Style, uh, I think both for Style Guidist and for um, uh, the other. <laughs> There are um, plugins for automatically run Jest and run Jest snapshots. So you know that uh, when you finish with your component and you, <coughs> you run the test, you update the snapshot, you know that is, uh, it should be correct like that. Because if you have some HTML, and if you have style in the HTML as well, it will, uh, uh, as well, uh, it will be easier to see regressions. Um, and yeah, basically, um, there are this automation already available. So please try it if you didn't try it before. Uh, again, it's not, it's not uh, just for React. You can use it for Vue. You can use it for Angular. You can use it for everything. Uh, thank you. The last thing we want to do is just to make sure that everything is working. All spectrum of testing, which is quite comprehensive. So we have functional testing, which is your code uh, in, ja in JavaScript. Uh, you could have functional uh, testing for, for your application for whatever language it is. Then from that case, refer to your own language specific library like JUnit for Java. Python will have its own, etc., etc. The next layer is API testing. So in this case, API testing, it, uh, it tends to be more unified, so you could you, there's, there are other tools to sound out like Postman itself, or uh, for what y'all use, y'all could technically use that to API test even let's say a Java application because at the end of the day, an API is a HTTP server, so it doesn't matter what's your testing code or development code, you could actually have it separately. The layer uh, the layer after that is the component testing, so this is where you yeah, yeah, you're taking a snapshot of the output and then you're comparing it historically. Then after that is end to end testing, so things like UIlicious or Web driver, and if uh, uh, it's not on, oh, yeah. oh, okay. So things like UI just like uh, and web driver will help let you know that uh, that your application is not working. Functional integration testing, but one thing that I joke about is like, for example, you can have white text on pink background, and UI just will say everything's okay because the button worked. On the flip side, think tools like Apply Two or uh, will let you know that something changed. So perhaps do something. Uh, all, you can have all these tools. And however, one thing that I see increasingly a problem, especially in Singapore, is the very habit of, oh, I set this up, I write this, uh, I write this test, I run it, yeah, it's great, six months down the road. When was the last time you ran a test? Uh, six months ago. So the, the, one of the things that is, while you run your test, it's equally important that you run it. 
and in particular, when you're talking about uh, tests that include integration thing, things like Stripe and all that, you should be running it regularly, be it daily, weekly, monthly, whatever schedule it is. Uh, best is always uh, with together with your commits and build, but however, different teams got different practices. So a uh, very quick run through on CI CD pipelines is that you is that uh, how many here have Jenkins or GitLab? Raise hands. See, one, two, three, four, five, six. So yeah. So uh, how many use Travis CI? Oh, okay, one, two, that. So, 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 so I'm not going to be go to specific. So th there are multiple CI CD tools. Uh, Jenkins is pr pretty much the older grandfather one. It's the open source one. You can install it anywhere you want. Uh, if you GitLab is the uh, is the newer thing right now because it does version control plus CI plus CD plus Kubernetes control plus a long list of other things. Um, and Travis CI is the popular open source one for the GitHub project. So you can actually integrate into, uh, you can just plug it into any of your GitHub project and you have your free CI CD tool. And uh, what is most common, uh, so I'm going to use Travis CI as an example. What is most common is that in your repository, how they work is that you integrate to your repository and you have a Travis.yml file for GitLab is GitLab.yml and for Jenkins and Jenkins.yml and so on. Um, so, so what you can do inside there is actually that very same bash script commands that you have been running to run to write your, to run your test. You could you could uh, you could first you, if you need to install dependencies, you could set up the script to install the dependencies. So you can do the installation steps. You can do this uh, this this by separating out so your system will know to actually catch these installation steps. Finally, you can do the execution. So this could be your npm run, or even in the case of your alicious, we, you could use it to trigger our CRI tool to actually run all those test script steps. All those complex processes, like for example, running ngrok and then putting and getting a URL and then testing it, can also be automated through the CI process. And once you uh, once you have that, you can always integrate it with Slack, and it should notify you in case anything go wrong. Um, unfortunately, so 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 unfortunately, because what we realized was that. When, when we launched our product previously, a lot of people came to us like, you need CI, you need CLI, you need CI CD. And then when we launched it, we realized only like three people were using the CI tool. Then when we went around asking, most of them said, yeah, we said that we wanted it to work with Jenkins, but we haven't had our Jenkins server yet. So, 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 so if, you, if you really don't have that, like at the very, very basic sim simple one, you could actually have set up like on, on our platform for your alicious, you could set up your sign up or login flow and you can set up monitoring. So monitoring is, is where you're able to schedule any job that you previously saw that you written, select the browsers that you want to run it on and select it to run it at a certain interval and to notify you by email, uh, by webhook, which can be used for Slack, for example. And, it, and you can schedule it to, let's say, run every night 2 a.m., which is, seems to be a very common thing regardless of what country you're at. Uh, and, and you get your results from there onwards uh, accordingly. So for example, in this case, the Netflix laptop one. So this is actually an actual Netflix test that we run continuously. And surprisingly, even Netflix sometimes fails. So like if you look at 5th of June, no, for so some- You need to go to uh, sometime in May. Uh, no, this, this, this is also like, when it went through, somehow I'm getting Espanol in Singapore, I don't know why, but these things actually happen without you noticing it. And, and sometimes test is not just about running it once, it's about running it again and again and again on your dev environment until touch, uh, like maybe because you created too many users, maybe your, just today, the talk we had, your index ran out of numbers, things like that. Run it continuously until your site breaks and you fix it. And yep, that's pretty much out of time. So yeah, please continuously test. Whatever testing tool you do, keep testing. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we have a CLI two chain which you can call through the CI CD. So I mean, you could call it through Bash. That's, that's how we integrate CI CD. We do plan to have better direct integration with things like Travis, uh, but that's a future plan. For now, we have a CLI two. Any other questions?